Salutations and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Kidology and I make videos about everything and anything to do with modern society. And that is precisely what we are talking about today because this is a very interesting video reaction that I think underpins a rather prevalent phenomena in modern societies today, especially as it pertains to social media. Now this video may be about lesbian bar drama, but I think it speaks to a rather bigger issue that I think is so so important and is just so, as I said, prevalent today. Now I'm going to be reacting to a reaction of the original video by a content creator who I think exemplifies this point that I'm going to be trying to make because it is something that has been getting on, I wouldn't say my nerves exactly, but it's something that really speaks to this issue right now, which is minorities not being taken seriously and increasingly not being taken seriously because of video reactions such as this and what they exemplify. And I think the thing which this reaction really shows is the difference, the stark difference between two groups of people and the sort of monopolization over a conversation and over the entirety of people by this one group of people who are just, at least when it comes to social media, everywhere. In our world of the oppression Olympics, there are in my mind two groups of people. The first being actual minorities and the second group being people who cosplay their minority status. This isn't to say that the cosplayers aren't minorities. It's just to say that they have essentially created either a brand or an aesthetic around their minority status, which they actually don't live by, mainly because not all minorities are equal insofar as being minorities. There are particular minorities minorities who are more privileged than other minorities and no minority is exactly the same, comes from the same background or the same circumstances, has the same experiences etc. What I see online is that people who cosplay their minority status get a lot more attention and are a lot more successful than actual minorities and I think this is for quite obvious reasons. Firstly, their minority cosplaying is often very aestheticized, it looks good and it gets them brownie points from the group and from their subscribers and their viewers. Being a minority is seen as something hip or cool and trendy. You can create a whole style, an entire brand around being a minority. And for that reason, people essentially want to be you or they want to emulate you. Why I call it cosplaying is because these people aren't in fact living the realities of being a minority. And this leads me to the queer kiwi and the sort of content which I think really exemplifies this very point, this very difference between actual minorities and those who like to cosplay their minority status. And this particular video reaction exemplifies this point perfectly for me. In this video, the queer kiwi reacts to a recent TikTok drama revolving around a lesbian bar. And this is said video which went viral on TikTok and which has resulted in a plethora of responses from different individuals all across the internet. Friday night I went to my first lesbian bar. I was about to go home early, but then my friend who's a lesbian came over to the bar at the restaurant we were at and said, I'm going to go to this bar. Do you want to come? And I was like, absolutely. Why not? We got there and I was having so much fun. Everyone was so nice. The music was all like Renee rap and I was living my best life. Until one of our guy friends wanted to meet up with us and he comes into the bar for quite literally two minutes. He literally wanted to come and say hello and leave. Girl approaches him pretty soon after he walks in and goes, what are you doing here? To be honest, I was a little taken aback because as a straight woman in a gay bar and also a straight woman who goes to a, a male gay bar, I've never felt like that before or been approached like that. The girl goes on to say like, I've been coming to this bar for 10 years and blah, blah, blah. Basically like my friend didn't belong there. Now I get it. It's a gay bar for women, for women. But the amount of very obviously flamboyantly gay men that were in that bar that were not being approached and yelled at was wild. And I'm just curious uh, your thoughts on this because I was like, I looked at her and I was nice until I wasn't. But the way she spoke to us like as a group and I looked at her and I was like, he's with us, he's good. Like she was not having it. She did not want him in that bar at all and I get it, but like, there's no rules against that, unless there are and I didn't see them. But we left soon after because we had already been there for a while and he just literally came to say hello. But I'm just curious, like, are males, are straight males not allowed to go to a lesbian bar? 
I am genuinely curious. Like I said, this was my first time going to a legit lesbian bar. So please, it, like, enlighten me. I guess, like, he's probably never going to go back there again because it really wasn't worth the drama. But I just feel it was a little dramatic. So this woman had a, I would say, a rather negative experience at a lesbian bar, actually a queer bar. If you go onto the website of the Cubby Hole, it is actually very clear that this is a place that is open to all people. Cubby Hole aims to maintain a safe space for all. No bigotry, racism, transphobia, or discrimination of any kind will be tolerated. We rely on all of our patrons to uphold a safe space for all. Staff members are available to assist if ever necessary. Necessary. So by my interpretation, not allowing discrimination of any kind means not discriminating against a straight, white, his, cis, gender man who comes into your bar and isn't causing anybody any harm, which this man wasn't by all accounts. Now, what I found most interesting was their queer Kiwi's response to this. And this, for me, is why so much support for the LGBTQ plus community is really waning. And I think I think it's waning for good reason when it comes to this kind of cosplaying of one's minority status. He's probably never going to go back there again because it really wasn't worth the drama. But I just feel it was a little dramatic. The entitlement that like drips off of this video is astounding. Honestly, it's quite impressive the level of entitlement that exists in this video. It's absolutely absurd to me that she doesn't understand like the problem here and is confused by the confrontation that happened um, and the upset that it caused. Now, this is one problem that I find with these minority cosplayers. I find it really an issue that when somebody asks a very honest question, a very vulnerable question in some cases, such as, for instance, about transgenderism or about identifying as non-binary, for instance, because these things are very complicated and very difficult, there is this assumption that you are somehow either being purposely stupid or that you are entitled for asking a question. Because this woman was actually just asking a question because in her experience, and I would say in the experiences that I've had going to gay bars, there really hasn't been this sort of rhetoric that straight people aren't allowed. Even if we take sexuality out of the conversation, even if we removed that and we're just like, this is a woman's space because, you know, she is a woman, so she should be able to understand that at least, right? You don't invite men into that space because it is a sanctuary away from men. That is not a space for men to be, yeah? Um, and especially cishet men. Like she mentioned that there were some like flamboyant gay men that were there and like, why isn't that a problem? The reason that isn't so much of a problem is one, if they were invited by like their sapphic friend, then they are allowed to be there just as you as a straight woman are allowed to be there. They aren't going to be going and like hitting on women and making women uncomfortable. They are there with their sapphic friend because they are both queer. They are in a queer space together and respecting that they are a guest in that queer space. Okay, this is a real issue that I see at the moment, which is interesting because this is sort of the exact same thing, which allegedly the queer community and allegedly minorities have been trying to fight against. And that is profiling people based on their appearance and how they look physically. Profiling and being judged on how you look and your appearance is literally the bane of existence for minorities. If this is something that we are meant to be trying to eradicate. Why is it okay for you to judge somebody on how they look? I, for instance, look like a very vanilla, straight individual. I'm not. And so am I not allowed into particular spaces because I don't look quote-unquote queer enough? I mean, this idea that there are not flamboyantly dressed and very feminine-looking straight men is absurd to me. This idea that this man who was confronted before anybody even knew his sexuality was assumed to be straight because of how he looked 
and his mannerisms, I suppose, is also absurd to me. And this is what makes me realize that cosplaying minorities don't actually care about equity. They don't actually care about egalitarianism. They don't want a particular group of people to have power. Instead, they want to have power. They don't actually want anything meaningful to change. They just want an exchange of the baton from somebody else's hands to their hands. I will stay that gay men going into a lesbian bar by themselves, that shouldn't happen. They shouldn't be there. Regardless, you brought a man, a cis het man into a safe space for queer women where queer women feel safe because we don't have very many spaces, you know? There are not many places where queer women feel welcome and accepted and safe. And so inviting a cishet man into one of those spaces is going to cause people to be a little bit on edge and a little bit uncomfortable because a lot of cishet men really like to go into these queer women spaces and take it upon themselves to hit on women and make women uncomfortable and it really ruins the entire thing for everyone that it was created for. I'm so sorry to break this too anybody. But bars and clubs are not safe spaces. They're just not. Bars and clubs are places where people go because they are thirsty, because they want to get intoxicated in order to forget about how terrible their lives are or to have a good time. They're places where people go to hook up with strangers and they're places where people go to engage in casual sexual encounters with people. If you are going to go into those spaces, you need to be prepared for that. In short, at a lesbian only bar, the fantasy of this safe space the sacred space where a woman can feel quote unquote safe, a lesbian can be just as predatory and just as harassing as any straight white man can. If you are going to a bar or you are going clubbing with the expectation that you are entering a safe space, you will soon realize that when you go to these spaces, safety is not the key thing. Having a good time via intoxication and in some cases drugs and psychedelics is really the objective. And this this leads to another reason which I don't see people talking about that much because it really doesn't feed into the narrative that lesbian spaces like clubs and bars are closing down or so infrequent. But one second, just before we get into all that, I would like to give a huge thank you to today's video sponsor, Rocket Money. As we all know, the cost of living is affecting young and old people the modern world over. Inflation is high and every penny counts more than ever before. And that is where Rocket Money comes in. Now, Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you to cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and manage your money better. The app aids you in saving more by seeing all of your finances and expenses in one place, essentially allowing you to take back control over your financial life. 80% of subscribers save money by using Rocket Money to find and cancel unwanted recurring subscriptions. In fact, Rocket Money has helped save its customers an average of $740 annually, with over $500 million in cancel subscriptions. The app can safely and securely identify these subscriptions, which often add up and can be difficult to keep track of. And this ultimately leads to millions spending money that could otherwise be saved. And with Rocket Money, there's no need to go through the nightmarish hassle of customer service calls. Rocket Money does all that for you. I also really appreciate that with Rocket Money, you can analyze your spending habits. So for instance, I've linked my Rocket Money to my PayPal account because I do all of my bills and my subscriptions through my PayPal. I also appreciate that Rocket Money sends me emails about where I can save money, about deals that they can get me. For instance, getting me a better deal with my monthly subscription to the New York Times. I would have never guessed I could do this. I would have never guessed that this was a possibility, but here I am paying less every month for my New York Times subscription. So to start saving and to spend less, join the over 5 million members currently using Rocket Money. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash codology or use my link down in the description box to get started with Rocket Money for free. Rocket Money is completely free to download and to use features such as basic budgeting and bill negotiation. You can also unlock more features with Rocket Money's premium subscription. Now remember that is rocketmoney.com forward slash codology to get started for free today. Thank you so much to Rocket Money for sponsoring today's video and for helping me to save just that little bit more which always adds up and will mean so much to me in the future. And with that let's get back to the video. 
Why are there so few lesbian only bars and why don't they turn over a profit? It's for a very realistic reason, which is that just like straight women are less likely than straight men to go clubbing and to go to bars, lesbians are less likely to go to bars and to clubs than gay men. It's not because of homophobia or the desecration of some safe space. It's because lesbians would much rather stay at home. Lesbians would much rather have lesbian brunch out in the daylight where they can actually see and hear people who they're speaking to and form real meaningful connections with somebody then engage in casual sexual encounters. Just like straight women would rather engage in meaningful connections and meaningful sexual encounters than casual sexual encounters and hookups. And this is why gay clubs and gay bars are so much more successful and are so much more prevalent in today's age of greater acceptance of LGBTQ plus people than are lesbian bars and lesbian clubs because they don't turn over the same kind of profit because they don't attract the same kind of loyal, eager audience of people who are going to come there looking for casual sexual encounters like men do. And this is what feeds into that argument that lesbian spaces and lesbian communities are gentrified by firstly queer men, that is by gay men, and then by straight people who follow the gay men into those spaces because it's cool and hip and it's a new thing and trendy and all that. When lesbian bars don't turn over a profit, they expand their demographic of interest, which mainly includes queer people. So gay men come in and then gay men bring all of their straight friends and straight people come in. And that's how these bars and these clubs are able to run by being fully inclusive of all people. Basically, if lesbians were into casual sex in as much as gay men are into casual sex, then this wouldn't even be a conversation and there would be lesbian only bars, lesbian only spaces that would be able to turn over a profit. Unfortunately, that is just not the case. And so this idea that there are sacred places for lesbians only, that there are bars that are lesbians only is a fantasy for the vast majority of bars and clubs that are directed and aimed at lesbian only demographics. Sorry, editing me here. I just want to make this point even clearer by giving another example, which is a very interesting example that has recently come to the attention of the internet. And that is the opening of a lesbian only, and that is a biological lesbian, cis lesbian only bar that is opening in London later this year. This bar is being opened by feminist campaigner Jenny Watson in London later this year and is called the L Community. Now, I think that this bar and everything that it is doing is representative of this point. This bar would not last long at all without heavy subsidization. And the way that it is subsidizing itself is by classing itself as a private members club. So it's not actually running on a conventional business model as would any other bar or club. And this subsidization is coming from the fact that it isn't actually a bar. It's a private members club, which means that members are going to likely be held to contracts. They're going to have to pay membership fees. And like with any private members club, there's likely going to be wealthy members. That is probably wealthy, gender critical feminists, friends of Jenny Watson's. She's probably made a lot of friends and connections due to other controversies that she's been involved in earlier this year, or I believe last year when it comes to gender critical feminism, etc. And if it does last, which I doubt it will because I think a lot of gender criticals are a lot more talk than they are bite. Just like with activists in general, a lot more talk than bite. I don't think it will really come to as great a fruition uh, in the long term at least. But if it does last, it will last not because it is running on a traditional business model, but because it is running on a very unconventional one. That is a private membership and a club. In short, it would not be able to brand itself as an exclusionary segregationist club where only cis lesbians are allowed to go if it was a traditional bar like cubbyhole. And personally, I don't think that subsidization will be enough before this new club, the L community, has to expand its membership and clientele. That will probably look like expanding to other gender critical feminists, to women in general, but it will definitely not be, in my humble opinion, a cis lesbian only membership private club for very long. I hope that makes my point a bit clearer. Yes, it sucks. I'm sure it sucks for a lot of lesbians, but for most lesbians that I encounter, we would much rather go to, as I said, brunch, a lesbian-only brunch, then go lesbian-only clubbing and bar hopping. Like you say, I don't understand why she was upset. Like there's not a rule that men can't be in there. Like. No, there isn't an official rule that men aren't allowed to go in, like straight men aren't allowed to go in. However, 
It's pretty, it's pretty heavily implied. <laughs> Who is it implied by though? Because lesbians come in all different shapes and sizes, all different opinions. So who's making these rules? Because this feels like you are making an arbitrary rule about something that you feel quite strongly about, which is that straightness is sort of categorically bad or has very negative connotations to it. And this is all based on stereotypes, especially stereotypes that regard profiling somebody by how they look, as opposed to a consensus that has been built by a community of very heterogeneous people who have very different opinions and perspectives on the matter. Not even Cubbyhole agrees with you on trying to create this quote-unquote safe space for queer people at a bar. Legally, you cannot deny them entry, um, but it seems, it seems like a pretty obvious conclusion to draw to not bring those people into these spaces. And to make it even worse, this lesbian bar is one of only three in the entirety of New York. And it has a capacity of 75. Only 75 people can go in there. And you took up one of those space with a cis het male friend to come say hi, which is bullshit because he had to wait in line to get in there. I know there was a fucking line to get in there. He had to wait in line to get in there. There's no way he just went in to say hi. Okay, firstly, how do you know this? This is such an assumption. How do you know that there was or wasn't a line? This is pure assumptive argumentation. It makes absolutely no sense. This is just your bias playing in. And that's fine. All human beings are biased, but admit that and acknowledge that to yourself and to your audience. Don't just claim that you know something when you clearly don't know anything, because this makes your entire argument fruitless and baseless, and nobody's going to believe you. What I also find so interesting about this argument is that this kind of argument can be and has been used by lesbians and by people who are then deemed to be transphobic when they say, for instance, that a transbian, that is a trans lesbian, is taking up the space of a lesbian, that is a cis lesbian. And this has been a very contentious argument within the queer community for some time. And I've especially seen it going speed dating rather serially for the past few months. What I've noticed and what has happened is that typically there's a divide between 70% cis lesbians and 30% trans lesbians. Now, based on the queer Kiwis line of argumentation, couldn't a cis lesbian make a perfectly valid argument that a trans -bian is taking up the space of other cis lesbians who could otherwise be there? But according to the arguments and expectations of the day and of these events, that would be transphobic and discriminatory. So by that logic, how is this not discriminatory? How is this not being heterophobic? to somebody who may come into, say, a queer space, and therefore in that space is a minority, that is, they are heterosexual, and in that space they are a minority. So in the same way that transbians are a minority in the lesbian space, surely this straight, cis, heteronormative white man, based on appearances, is a minority in this queer space. And I want to return to this point when it comes to the response from the woman who called out and essentially discriminated against this cis, het male for being in a lesbian space. Because I think this is so telling as to why cosplaying minorities are rarely never at peace. And I also would like to add in the part where she's like, I, as a straight woman, go to male gay bars all the time. Why isn't that a problem? Why am I allowed there when straight men aren't allowed into lesbian bars? I don't think straight women should be going to gay bars either. <laughs> and this, this is where I know that you are cosplaying your minority status because unlike actual minorities, you are able to abstract yourself from reality without any consequence or any meaningful ramifications to your being or to yourself or to your minority status. And that is because you don't have to engage meaningfully or impactfully with that reality. It doesn't actually impact you. You saying that you don't think that straight women should be allowed in lesbian only bars either is a pure abstraction from the reality that these bars rely on the patronage of all people in order to just stay afloat. For the reasons that I said before about the difference between how men and women go out at night, men are also more likely to spend more money on drinks and at bars than women are. The reality is that these lesbian-only safe spaces are, above everything else, not social justice institutions and safe spaces. They are businesses working and functioning 
functioning within a free market where they have to make a profit in order to stay afloat. That is the reality and that is the priority above all of this branding. Cubby Hole, like all bars, especially queer bars, have this very good branding of being safe spaces, of being places where they prioritize the safety of the people who patronize them. But above all else and above all of this branding and all of this gloss, they are ultimately businesses that are trying to make money. And like it or not, to make money, they have to appeal to a wider demographic of people than lesbians. That is just the way that it is. I'm a part of many meetup lesbian only groups. And I will tell you that 90% of the events that are organized, that are arranged are non-club and non-bar related. Lesbians like to go on hikes. They like brunch. They like game nights. They like movie nights and they like going to the theater. And most of the events that are arranged at bars and at clubs, that is the 10% that are arranged at bars and clubs are typically either in just normal bars and clubs where everybody goes or a room is rented out for the lesbian only event or they are inclusive of everybody that is of queer men of queer women of straight people whatever because they know that that is how they're going to make money for these events straight people you have all of the bars all of the bars are your bars can you leave ours alone to us, please. <laughs> the amount of straight women that go into gay bars to feel safe away from straight men is quite astounding. There's quite a lot of them who do that and then will get like upset when they are hit on by queer women. And even if that's not you, even if you just go to a gay bar just to feel safer away from straight men, now straight men have like caught on to that and know that straight women go there to escape being hit on by straight men. So now gay bars are overrun by straight people who just are privileged enough to be able to take up all of the spaces. And this is why I say that you cannot make bars and clubs safe spaces. They're not safe spaces, like they're just not. And humans don't function on the basis of what is the most politically correct thing to do. When you go out at night, you're thinking about how fun of a night you can have. You're not thinking about being politically correct. You're not thinking about social justice. You're just thinking about getting wasted and hopefully hooking up with somebody. And that's why so few lesbians go out. That's why I'd rather go to lesbian brunch then go lesbian clubbing please just leave us something all of the bars all of the clubs they belong to you already why do you need to come and take our stuff off of us you have all of them and if you feel unsafe there and it's like not enjoyable i'm really sorry like that sucks but that doesn't really give you the right to come into our safe spaces and make our safe spaces feel unsafe and again this is an abstraction from reality all the bars don't belong to straight people the few bars that are there for queer people don't belong to queer people these bars and clubs belong to the owners of these bars and clubs they're businesses they're not social justice entities i just really don't understand how like you as a woman have come into like this safe woman's space and felt the need to invite a man into it when you are already the guest in this space. So forgive me, if a straight woman doesn't like going to straight bars because her friends may be all queer, for instance, they may all be lesbians, and so she goes with them to a queer bar. If straight women go to queer bars because they just prefer the music or they prefer the drinks, I would say that based on my experience of clubbing recently, I found that the queer bars have far more interesting and vivacious drinks and options and a far more interesting clientele as well as a far more interesting and welcoming staff and bar staff. So I can understand why so many straight people go there, especially when all of these queer bars advertise themselves as being open and welcoming to everybody, including straight people who are included in that umbrella of everybody. Said straight woman shouldn't go there because she feels safer there, because she enjoys it more, because she likes the drinks or the ambiance, because her friends are there, because, well, tough luck for you. You're straight. That's your sexuality, your sexual orientation, which you can't choose. But now you're being discriminated against because of that. This regrettably makes no sense whatsoever.
Now, what I found most telling and most interesting about this was the response video made by the woman who approached this straight man at the bar. Now, based on how the queer Kiwi responded and based on how TikTok responded, I assumed that this straight man was probably doing something untoward, such as trying to riz up or flirt with queer woman who had rejected his advances and he just wasn't getting the message or he wasn't taking no for an answer or he was just being a right nuisance. No, in fact, absolutely none of this. So let's take a look at what happened according to the woman who called him out for being there. What are you doing here? To be honest, I was a little taken aback because as a straight woman, so that video is actually about me. I'm that lesbian. So I just wanted to provide some context on what happened uh, from my perspective. So I was at Cubby Hole, been going to this bar for eight years since I moved to New York. I actually met my wife there. Um, I was waiting in the bathroom line, minding my own business. And there was a dude standing in front of the bathroom. Um, I tapped him on his shoulder. I was like, excuse me, you know, you're kind of in the way, whatever. I was not trying to start conflict, anything like that. He turns around. He seemed a little bit grumpy. I love how, according to her, he seemed a little grumpy. He may have been grumpy, sure, but what does that even mean? Did he, like, just look at you funny because you tapped him on the shoulder? I think anybody who gets tapped on the shoulder by a stranger and is told that they're in the way or that they've done something wrong when they're just standing there is going to probably look at you a bit funny or is just going to give you a look, obviously, because, you know, you're trying to get their attention by touching them. So <laughs> what does seem a little grumpy mean? I'm not getting any information from that. But what I am getting is that when he looked at you, you decided to go in and say, are you even here with anybody? He turns around. He seemed a little bit grumpy. So I was like, okay, dude, uh, are you even here with anyone? Like, what are you doing in this bar? You, in the words of sort of modern lingo about this, microaggressively responded to him looking at you because you tried to grab his attention. And your microaggression came in the form of questioning why he was there. That is, whether he was there with somebody. Based on how he looked. Which, according to you, I guess he didn't look queer enough. I guess he didn't look flamboyant enough. He didn't look gay enough. He just looked too vanilla. And so that justifies you asking him about his business, which has nothing to do with you. And this is another thing that I find very, very telling and very annoying. And he points to his friend, a girl who seems pretty queer to me. Uh, not the girl who made that other video. And she's like, he's with me. I, I'm like, okay, cool. Again, this seem, a girl who seems pretty queer to me. What does that even mean? All of this is based on profiling of people, on their physical appearance. You know nothing about somebody based on how they look. This is exactly the thing that actual minorities have been trying to fight against or to speak out against because they get profiled based on how they look, based on how they present, because they are discriminated against on that basis. And you are doing the exact same thing, but you can't see that because you're cosplaying your minority status, which means you don't have to engage with reality or the meaningful ramifications of your actions because, well, this is all just exteriors to you, clearly. I turn around, um, continue to wait in line, really had to pee, and um, then this guy comes to me and he goes, well, if I wasn't here with someone, would that be a problem? And I say, absolutely. Like, yes, it would be a problem. This guy, the girl in that video, some other girls, they all jump at me and they're like, what? Like, why would you say that? That's so messed up, blah, blah, blah. These people start coming at me and I'm just in the bathroom. I'm there celebrating a friend's birthday. I want literally nothing to do with straight people, which is why I'm in cubbyhole in the first place. Again, I like to just mention the safe space rules and regulations of cubbyhole on their website for everybody to see because he was being discriminated against because of how he looked. And you know, I'm just like, hey, okay, this is a queer bar. We don't have a lot of spaces. I've been coming to this bar for a long time. It's a special place for me. It's also a safe place for me. And I have seen a lot of cis straight guys come into this bar and cause problems. Like it's a known thing. It happens at Cubby Hole. It happens at Henrietta's. It happens at Stonewall. There are straight dudes that come into these bars specifically because they're trying to pick up girls. And this is so interesting. This is the point that I wanted to get back to. This assumption that people place onto other people because of how they look. And that is when you just stereotype people because they look a certain way. And so you assume preemptively without any evidence, without any justification beyond your stereotype that they are going to behave in a certain way and are going to do a certain thing. This is why in the UK, black men get profiled by the police on the street 
street when they're just walking and doing their business because of stereotypes and preemptively judging people based on how they look. This kind of response would have made sense to me if this guy had been standing at the bar trying to chat up lesbians who were rebuffing his advances and saying, no, we are not interested. This response would have been perfectly adequate in my opinion. But this man was just standing waiting to go to the bathroom or waiting for his friend who'd gone to the bathroom. He wasn't doing anything. He wasn't talking to anybody. He wasn't disrupting anybody. You purposefully disrupted, as Gen Z like to say, your peace by making his business, which was none of your business, your business. And this is something that I've seen at speed dating events. When cis lesbians decide to make the business of transbians doing nothing except trying to just have a good time and meet new people and make friends and maybe get a match with somebody, their business. They make it their business when it needn't be their business. Why are you going to worry about that 30% of transbians who you're not even interested in in the first place when you could be enjoying the company, enjoying the fun times with the 70% of cis lesbians who are there? And this is an example of picking your battles, something which cosplaying minorities just do not understand. Actual minorities pick their battles. Transbians, who are, in my opinion, actual minorities, pick their battles. They go to these events, they know that they are minority, they know that it's a hard place for them to navigate and be in, that there's just a lot of things and a lot of hurdles. But having spoken to a lot of transbians at these speed dating events, it's very clear that they enjoy going to them. They know that they may have some negative encounters, they know that they are probably not going to get matches or the matches that they hoped for, but they go and they meet new people and make new friends and have interesting conversations with people. And I found the most annoying thing at these events is when there is one lesbian, because sometimes there's always that one lesbian who decides to ruin her entire night by fixating on the 30% of transbians who are there, who are having a good time and who she needn't engage with if she doesn't like them or doesn't want them to be there and can have a great night with the 70% of cis lesbians who are there, who she may be interested in. It's a matter, in my opinion, of picking your battles. And this is an example of really not picking your battle well. There are straight dudes that come into these bars specifically because they're trying to pick up girls. So I wasn't trying to instigate anything. I was just trying to like, hey, safety check. You know? And again, I completely understand this and I do see this. It is very annoying. It is annoying. Like, you know, there are guys who do that. But this one guy wasn't giving any indication that he was doing that. You profiled him. You assumed based on how he looked and the stereotypes associated with how he looks. And this is the thing again, just because a handful of men act in a disgusting, degrading, horrible, entitled way doesn't mean that all men do. In the same way that there's this assumption that white heteronormative men are running the world, the reality is that there's a small group of men, irrespective of race or ethnicity, who are running the world or are running particular sectors and institutions of the world and have a grip on power and that the rest of mankind and womankind and humankind are pretty much subservient to them. We have so much more in common with each other, with each other's struggles, with each other's qualms than we like to admit because of, I would say, a lot of the rhetoric that comes from these people cosplaying their minority status, which just makes them feel good, which makes them feel like they are doing something meaningful in the world, that they are battling against the evil cis heteronormative men who are taking over and destroying society and everything good. But the more that I engage with these progressives and the more that they talk about progress, the more I realize that their notion of progress has absolutely nothing to do with the definition of progress. Wow, that was a lot of progress in one sentence. It's simply about having a different group of people on top, namely their group. And their group is engaged in the exact same type of discrimination, the exact same type of profiling, the exact same kind of segregationist and exclusionary thinking and rhetoric, the exact same type of stereotyping as the group who they are allegedly fighting against. So I wasn't trying to instigate anything. I was just trying to like, hey, safety check. You know? Safety check is just a euphemism for profiling, just, just so you know. It's the exact same kind of rhetoric in cases in the UK where police have profiled young black men. They say that it's for safety, you know, this kind of safety check. Um, yeah, I just get heated, but that's pretty much it. I'm Katie and I'm that lesbian and sorry, but actually not sorry. So she didn't even really confront him. She didn't really confront him. I heard somebody use this word, Delululand, people living in Delululand. I would say that this, this applies quite perfectly to that. This is delusion. Because of this, there were a few people who called her out like, why did you assume he was a cis man? Like, how did you know he was a cis straight man in the first place? And I, 
think that like that's a slightly like unreasonable question to ask that's a slightly unreasonable question to ask i'm so sorry but the bias in this is just so insufferable to listen to there is no consistency in this argumentation because imagine if this white cis heteronormative guy had just had one of his identity groups changed imagine if he was a black guy oh my gosh imagine like imagine if he was the most stereotypically straight looking black guy do you honestly think that katie would have approached him now unlike the queer kiwi here i'm not going to engage in this bad faith argument but i would bet quite a bit of money that this would have been a very different conversation that katie had with the man if he had been black very different you don't have to move king wakanda forever I'll just pee on the ground like your ancestors had to. I understand that trans men are allowed in like lesbian spaces and like queer women spaces because you know, they also suffer from a lot of gender discrimination and might not feel safe in other spaces. That's interesting as well. That is so interesting. How would you know that this man wasn't a trans man, a transbian who just hadn't transitioned yet? How do you know this? And this is one of the issues with making places inclusive, I think, because inclusivity without any boundaries, without any repercussions, without any consensual conversation with the patronage of a place, with the community, creates issues like this. It creates issues like this where it just becomes very clear that human beings are not as inclusive as we like to pretend to be. And cosplaying minorities are the demographic of people who like to pretend that they are 100% inclusive, but then they're not. And they can't possibly be because that's just impossible for human beings. But at the same time, you can't have a conversation with them about it because they don't want to engage with it and they don't need to engage with it. They don't need to engage with the realities of the consequences of being fully inclusive because, well, conveniently, you can just blame everything on white men and end of. But I still think that asking a man that you see in that space, like, why are you here, is completely valid. And I think that trans men who understand why women may feel afraid and uncomfortable with a man there would understand that and be sympathetic to that and not respond with aggression. So I feel like just responding with aggression kind of solidifies the fact that this is a says hat man. So I feel like just responding with aggression kind of solidifies the fact that this is a says hat man. Like the entitlement, the arrogance, and the aggression in that response really solidifies that this is not his space, but he feels like he deserves to be in it. I love how a man asking a question about why he was questioned for being somewhere is instantly deemed aggressive by virtue of him being a man. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that so stereotypical? How is he entitled, arrogant, and aggressive for asking a question? Asking a question when he was approached by somebody and questioned about why he was there. He has every right to ask a question. Why can't people ask questions? This is how we find out things. This is how we find out information about things and situations. Just like the straight woman who made her TikTok was asking a genuine question whether this was a problem because apparently, according to Katie, this was a problem. Are males, are straight males not allowed to go to a lesbian bar? I am genuinely curious, like I said, this was my first time going to a legit lesbian bar. She's asking a question. Like, of course she's looking for validation. Of course she's not just asking a question, but she is trying to find out. Maybe things have changed. Maybe the rules of the game have changed. But I think that we are demonizing people for asking questions, which is why people don't ask questions anymore, which is why people just assume things or just answer questions for themselves, which leads to everybody having a completely different narrative and understanding of the world. Like, we're not communicating or engaging with each other, meaning and when people ask questions and you treat them like this, this is why people don't ask questions. And this is why so much support is being lost for the basic tenets of LGBTQ plus rights and people. I'm also maybe a little stressed over the video that's been viral on my page right now because I didn't mean any ill will by it and the lesbians of TikTok are coming for me and I'm sorry for that. I really just had a genuine question. I didn't know I was going to get yelled at bombarded, screamed at. There's lots of mean things going on in those comments. So I have learned my lesson and I will never be returning to a lesbian bar ever again. For good reason. I am sure that if you approached a trans man and asked that, they would respond in a much gentler way. Either, you know, saying that they are trans because they're in a space where it is like safe to say that, 
or by just being like, hey, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm with those people over there, please don't mind me. It's not going to be an aggressive response. I'm sure that if you asked a trans man that he would respond in a more gentler way. Have you seen the battles online and in the real world between trans people and gender critical feminists? Have you seen how vitriolic and horrible they are to each other? Like, <laughs> can you imagine one of the trans activists being asked at a lesbian only bar, lesbian only bar that is fully inclusive of people, so who knows? Can you imagine them being asked by Katie why they are there and responding in a non aggressive way? This is what you call essentialist argumentation. This idea that particular people have essential characteristics. Because according to the queer Kiwi, cis heteronormative white men are essentially aggressive when they ask a question. So they are essentially bad just for asking a question whereas a trans person who gets asked a question is essentially a good person so they will essentially answer without aggression and in a far more civil and kindly way there is no evidence for this whatsoever and that's the basis of essentialism there's no reasonable basis for anything it's like people who essentially think that black people are either criminals or black people are essentially good and saintly depending on what side of the political spectrum on the extreme political spectrum you are Essentialism is terrible. It's awful. It is the absolute base level of any kind of argumentation or notion of how the world works and how people are. Essentialism is laziness at its finest. And that's why, as I said, this is a perfect example of cosplaying minority status because you don't need to engage with reality and you don't face the consequences of the reality which you are fabricating in your mind. And I also imagine that a lot of trans men would feel like quite, you know, elated almost that they pass well enough to be mistaken for a cis man in a lesbian bar. You know what I mean? Like, they're not gonna respond with aggression. And I think that really answers the question and think that that makes it unfair that people are being like, well, how did you know? Why did you assume? Like, she didn't. She just asked a man why he was there and he responded aggressively, so. And that's the thing, she didn't just ask why he was there. She was purposefully and pointedly asking him because she was annoyed with him and had profiled him. This is why we need to talk to each other because you can't just lump together groups of people and make essentialist claims about them, their behavior and their characteristics. Because then when you actually go into reality and a cis white man is actually a decent fellow and is nice and friendly, what are you gonna do? Your entire worldview is just this is why you need to treat people like individuals. This is why you need to treat every individual that you encounter in the world like an individual. Because if you don't, you assume things about whole groups of people that are just not true. And this is why we don't get anywhere in our current cultural arguments and our current cultural wars. Because everybody is in these identitarian groups that make assumptions about everybody else, that have essentialist claims and characteristics attributed to particular groups. And we don't get anywhere. We really don't. Because that is not how people people actually are. Everybody's different. And the sooner we realize that, the closer we get to realizing the alleged progressive, good, all-inclusive, homogenous world that allegedly we all want. Like surely the fact that straight people feel welcome in queer spaces and queer people increasingly feel welcome in straight spaces is a good thing. But according to the logic of the queer Kiwi, this is not a good thing. We should not be celebrating this. We should not be happy that a straight man feels that he's able to be friends with a lesbian and a straight woman because god forbid in this world apparently men and women can't actually be friends i mean shouldn't we be celebrating this that there are queer women who like a straight man and have invited them into their space into their group and that they're having a good time together isn't this a point for celebration isn't this what inclusivity and acceptance is about but no apparently this is a terrible thing regardless of whether a cis hit man is invited in by a queer friend or not doesn't really matter i don't think he should be there and i I think that queer women shouldn't be inviting their cis het male friends into these spaces. This is you disrupting your peace for no reason, except because there's just always something to complain about. Something that actual minorities who actually experience the realities of being minorities don't complain about because they live in reality. As a straight person, you can go literally anywhere. You can go anywhere. You can go to any bar. Especially as a cishet man, you can go to any bar and feel safe. And yet, <laughs> and yet, you stood in that line surrounded by queer non-cis men, right? You stood in that line 
around all those people and waited to get in and you never once thought like, maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe these people behind me deserve to go into this bar more than I do. The assumptions. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, especially this idea of people cosplaying their minority status, because this is something that I see everywhere. And it is just such a prevalent thing at the moment. It's sort of this almost glamorization of being a minority and complaining about every little thing and making it everybody's issue and acting incredibly entitled to things that most minorities just accept that reality just is not a reality of our making. We're all essentially playing a game. Most minorities accept that they're playing a game that they're not in control of, but they can make the best out of that game and they can still enjoy playing the game. Whereas these cosplayers tend to believe that they are in charge of the game. And if they're not in charge of the game, that they should be in charge of the game and they make it everybody else's business that they should be in charge of the game, if that metaphor makes any sense. But anyway, let me know what you think. I would be fascinated to hear your opinion on this situation. Thoughts and prayers to everybody in this situation, especially to the poor guy who just wanted to hang out with his friends at an all-inclusive bar. Thank you so much to Rocket Money for sponsoring today's video, and I'll see all of you very, very soon in the next one.